Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Seek and Destroy. And today we're going to talk about Loki and the finale and everything and all my thoughts and all my, you know, everything I kind of ingested from that finale, which was awesome. So we are going to get into spoilers. So if you have not seen the show yet and you don't want to get spoiled, turn away now and avoid the internet because I'm sure a lot of people are talking about what this show did because I was surprised. I'm going to put a link down below to my my five theories going into this finale. Um, if you want to learn more about what I thought of the show, which I'll talk a little bit more about here too, but if you want to hear an expanded version of what I've been thinking of the show, definitely check out that video. It went up a couple days ago. I actually recorded it on Monday, two days before the finale, and then I was sick on you know Tuesday, <laughs> and then I finally got it edited and it was rendering, and I fell asleep, and then I woke up around 3, 3.30 in the morning, and I was like, oh, I got to post that video, but the show has already aired. But hey, you know what? I haven't watched it yet. So, and I recorded this a few days ago. So let's post that. And that'll give me a few more days to gather, you know, to watch the episode and gather my thoughts on it. Um, and then I also did, I did something I don't normally do. I went out and watched a couple other YouTubers like uh, Double Toasted, who I'm a big fan of watching their channel. And I watched a couple other channels about their thoughts on it and kind of what they gleamed from it. Um, Sasha, someone who's popped in on, on this channel a couple times, who I watch, who does reaction stuff. Like um, she, she did a great stream the other day with a, her friend Jack that I, I was listening to them and uh, and i was like really just interested in all the the theories and the versions of things and how people interpret stuff like i just like that stuff and i, I always like hearing other people's like what they got out of the show what they liked and stuff and so i'm going to share my thoughts here but like i said we're going to get into spoilers so i don't want to ruin it for you so go watch the show if you if you're able to and come back here after you've seen it unless you don't care then hang out and you know comment down below and let me you know hear your thoughts on you know the stuff i talk about or stuff you've heard about the show as well um but yeah definitely watch it though it's really good uh the disney plus shows they've been kind of hit or miss uh, for me, uh, hit and miss, I should say, because Wanda, I thought, started really strong. I loved all the sitcom stuff. I'm a big fan of those shows. Like, I love Lucy and Bewitched. I, like, I really dig all that. So I was really digging the show for the first half. And then the last, like, two episodes, the show, to me, kind of fell apart. I didn't really like the wrap-up of some of the characters. And I know people are going to think I'm just complaining about the the boner stuff, like, you know, the, with her brother um, being Pietro and not Pietro or whatever. I mean, yeah, that was a little disappointing, but I wasn't fully banking on that to wrap up the show. I just like things to conclude in a good way. I know they got to set up more stuff for Marvel, um, you know, and, and take these characters in further directions after the shows. But I still was like, you know, Darcy, I think, only had like a blip of a moment at, at the end. Uh, no pun intended. I know the blip is kind of a thing in Marvel. Um, but Darcy barely showed up in the finale. Uh, the way she took down the bad guy, that was clearly something that was, there was probably going to be more to that. But I think COVID affected their filming of those final episodes. And to me, it showed. And I know that's not completely their fault, but at the same time, um, I have to you know, give my reaction to what I saw, and what I saw I didn't really like. So the final two episodes of Wanda kind of lost me. Even though there was a, one or two good moments in them, I still didn't like how it ended. Same with Falcon and Winter Soldier. I thought it had a better ending than Wanda did, but that and Black Widow, they're more straightforward kind of Marvel movies where it's just like action and you know things like that. But what I liked Falcon and Winter Soldier dealt with is the people that got blipped away what is it like? Because Spider-Man, that movie didn't deal with that at all. There was like, hey, we, we disappeared for five years. Now we're back and we got to go to school and then we're going to go to a European vacation. It, that seemed rushed and dumb. Like, I don't think that's a priority to send kids over to Europe after the world, world blipped. Like, I think there's other things you could do with the, you know, set other vacations and stuff you can send with the kids or not do any of that um, and save money for the schools because they probably need it. <laughs> so to me, I never really liked what they did with Spider-Man. I felt like they glossed over the blip thing. The Disney Plus shows handled that well with like Photon, um, uh, Monica Rambeau in, in the uh, WandaVision show. And then obviously the people, like the rebellion group that rises up um, in Falcon and Winter Soldier. So I did like that because it dealt with, well, what's it like a little bit? Like if you if you got blipped away for five years, you come back, you're not a citizen of this country anymore. You don't have your apartment or house anymore. Uh, everything was kind of taken from you in a way. Like you don't have a bank account anymore. I thought all that was neat. They didn't delve on it too much, but I still thought that the fact that they touched on it was the stuff I liked in the show. But some of the other stuff I was kind of like, meh on. I was just like, whatever. But all the Zemo stuff I loved, because Zemo's awesome. And it's clear that they're setting up Thunderbolts and Young Avengers a little bit, because we have uh, the, the Wanda's twins, obviously are members of Young Avengers. So we have them, Wiccan and Speed. They were introduced kind of as kids in, uh, in WandaVision. And then, uh, you know, obviously we don't know what's going to happen with Vision, but... He's white vision now, so that might play into something Young Avengers later, maybe. Um, then we also have Falcon Winter Soldier. Uh, they introduced um, Isaiah Bradley and his grandson, Eli. 
um, who, as we know, is the Patriot in the Young Avengers team. So I thought that was cool. We're also living in a world where the Avengers aren't really together. You know, after Endgame, everyone's kind of gone off to do their own things, so the Avengers aren't really around, which is also, like in the comics, the perfect time for the Young Avengers to start rising up. We got Hawkeye coming up soon, uh, where we have uh, Kate Bishop. She's going to be appearing in that show, uh, so that's going to be another Young Avengers member. And then, obviously, uh, we have Stature, uh, Ant-Man's daughter, She's going to be in a movie coming up with Kang the Conqueror. And those two characters actually have a connection in the comic books. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm really excited to see where they're going to take all this. And like I said, they're starting to build these young Avengers. And this show is no different. So for Loki, we obviously are getting introduced to the concept of Kang the Conqueror. And that directly ties into Young Avengers and their first mission in the comic books, which is to take down Kang the Conqueror when the Avengers aren't around to do it. Um, so... Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Kang is my favorite Avengers villain. I didn't. I grew up an X Men kid, so I didn't really read a lot of Avengers stuff. But anytime I did, and Kang was there, I was locked in. And whenever Kang met the Fantastic Four or Doctor Doom, I always loved those interactions too. So, uh, so for me, I'm excited for Kang. Uh, I'm big time excited. Uh, Kang even ties into X Men lore a little bit when he was Rama Tut. That is also the origins of Apocalypse. The uh, the X Men villain was around the time of Rama Tut's reign in uh, e ancient Egypt. And that was also Kang the Conqueror traveled back in time and being a pharaoh. So, uh, so yeah, Kang has been many things, as he says in this episode. Jonathan Majors, who plays him, who appears in this final episode, is great. And my thoughts overall on Loki, like I said, I'll put a link down below. I put my top five theories going into the finale. I recorded that episode a couple days before the show aired, the final episode aired. But I didn't actually get to upload it until the final episode aired. But I hadn't watched the final episode yet, so I figured it'd be fun to post it up there. And then see what theories I got wrong, which I got a major one wrong. Uh, because WandaVision kind of ended the way it did, and Falcon and Winter Soldier ended the way it did, where neither of those shows really introduced a new major character for the Marvel Universe, I just assumed the same thing for Loki. I heard rumors it was going to get a second season, but I wasn't sure. I, you know, I was like, eh, I can't go off rumors. I want to see what the show delivers. Obviously, we are going to get a second season, but it did what those other two shows didn't do. So I was going into this going, from episode one, I was like, it's probably Kang or Immortus, but I doubt they're gonna do that. It just seems too obvious because like I, you know, I said in my video where I talked about the five theories, Renslayer, like all these characters linked to Kang the Conqueror, the Edge of Time, Eliath, all these things linked to Kang. I just thought it was too obvious. I was like, there's no way. Like they're, they're, Marvel's gonna put their little goofy spin on it and it's probably just gonna be another Loki in that castle or something. So I was thinking, dumb i was actually thinking the stuff that disappoints me in marvel i was thinking along those lines because the previous two shows have disappointed me a little bit which is unfair because it's clear that that was not the case here they wanted to create something that is going to set up the future of marvel movies or at least some marvel stories going forward like a multiverse war uh, which is big and epic and awesome and dealing with this character who hearing his backstory and jonathan major's when he appears and he's eating the apple, I love that. I think Double Toasted, because I watched a couple other reviews of the show. Um, Sasha and her friend Jack, I watched a little bit of their live stream. Actually, I watched the whole live stream for them. Um, but I was watching other videos to see what people were kind of taking away from this show. And uh, they all, it's really cool. Like, I love seeing people who are new to comics and new to this world um, looking at it. Um, I also like people who came in in the first Iron Man movie and have been growing up with these characters in, in cinema. And hearing their perspectives of it people my age who are like encyclopedias for comics and hearing our opinions about it it's been really neat just kind of seeing everyone's kind of viewpoint on this because going into this show i was like i don't think they'll do a mortis and kang there's just no way they're going to do that because they're going to try to button up this story in some way um i was dead wrong uh and i'm kind of glad because jonathan major is a great actor and seeing him in this part playing Immortus was awesome and he was kind of chilling and when he was eating that apple it was funny because double toasted had asked they were like they made a comment in their video like why why is he eating an apple and i commented i said like well i'm not very religious and i don't know the whole thing but i think there's that somehow ties to the bible and that um the whole thing about apples is that it symbolizes the fall of man sin um immortality or us walking away from paradise um and then also knowledge and so that's kind of, and it's because I've written stories too, including stuff about, um, like Monomyth was a book I did, and that dealt with the repercussions of Adam and Eve eating the apple. Um, of course, I had people writing me going, like commenting back like, yeah, dude, it wasn't an apple, it's just called the forbidden fruit. 
And it's like, okay, so we, we don't know if it's an apple or not an apple. You, you just said you don't know what it is. Yes, I know the Bible doesn't specifically say an apple, but that's what interpretations have done over the generations of that story is that oftentimes when you see pictures of that scene in you know paradise where Adam and Eve are there, you typically see them holding an apple in some visual depictions. Doesn't mean it's right. Obviously, none of us were there with Adam and Eve, so we don't know, uh, but it's a story and people pull from it what they want. And over the years, fr uh, you know, forbidden fruit has been defined as apple to a lot of people. So that's why in fiction like this, you have, uh, uh, what's his name, Immortus showing up eating the apple. I love that because if you notice, as he's eating the apple, he's talking to the two Lokis. He actually sets the apple down at one point and stops eating it. And he pretty much ate it to its core. And then a minute later, he kind of goes, do you feel that? And they're like, what? And he goes, we cross the threshold. I, I don't know what's gonna happen next. And they're like, you're lying. And he's like, I, I don't. And I thought that was neat that they it was subtle because he stopped eating the apple. So if apple is immortality, if it's knowledge and all that, and he finishes it, he doesn't have that anymore. Kind of, it, it doesn't mean that specifically, um, but that's just it was just a neat little thing in the scene. So I commented on double toasted, but I, I liked seeing other people like what they take from the show and, and the little things they notice and the big things they notice and stuff they don't notice and it's just fun. And so like I I ended up really liking them bringing in you know, the Immortus character or he who remains. Cause that's the only, they don't really refer to him as Immortus. He kind of is Immortus if you know the comics, but they call him he who remains, which in the comics, he who remains is not Kang the Conqueror. It's not Immortus, it's not a variant of them or a version of them. It's just a, a different character altogether. Uh, my friend Nathan actually uh, predicted that he who remains will be the name of the person in that castle at the end. That was one of his predictions. And I didn't mention that in my prediction video, but that was a good prediction because he obviously got it right. Uh, but I thought He Who Remains was going to be like another version of Loki because like I said, the other shows kind of disappointed me and I thought this show was, I don't think another Loki would have disappointed me, but it just seemed to be on par with the other shows. But no, what they're doing here, at least in my eyes, is they're setting up the next Thanos. And unlike Thanos, where we got his story at the end in Infinity War and a little bit in Endgame, a little bit more in Endgame, but mostly Infinity War, we got his full story. This time we're getting all of Kang's story, or the person who will be Kang, we're getting it all up front. Um, I liked that because when he's telling the story of the two Lokis, Loki's genuinely scared. And Sylvie just doesn't trust anyone. So she's just like, I don't care what he's saying to me. I'm not gonna let it affect me. I came here to kill him and that's what I'm gonna do. I really like that dynamic where she's the one who can't trust people and Loki's the one that can't be trusted. And so in the end, the immovable object and the unstoppable force have to come together and clash and Sylvie ends up betraying Loki, which really broke my heart because one of my theories was that she was gonna do that and that I was gonna hate her for it and I do hate her for it. And I do hate the character now, although I feel like there is a chance for redemption for her. So it's okay to hate her right now because I think she'll redeem herself later because after she does kill Kang or Immortus or he who remains, uh, after she does kill him, she sees all those branches going out and she realizes, oh crap, I, I messed up. And so I'm curious to see where they go with her in the second season. Loki apparently is gonna show up in the next Doctor Strange movie, so we're gonna get more from him there. Um, but this show I liked because it had this very kind of Terry Gilliam a little bit approach to it. Wizard of Oz, big time. I was definitely noticing that from the first couple episodes where I was like, oh, they're walking down this yellow room, kind of like Yellow Brick Road. There's this big city that Loki's like mesmerized by. Uh, power and things don't work the same there. Like, you know, the rules of physics and stuff when uh, Dorothy ended up in Oz, some things were a little different. Um, I, you know, like there could be talking lions and tin men and stuff. And so Loki's looking around and seeing all this stuff and he sees those, you know, infinity stones, the thing that he was after and helping Thanos to get ultimate power and they're just paperweights in this dimension. I thought that was amazing. That That's what a great way to kind of humble Loki and make him realize that the stuff he was truly after to conquer was small potatoes, like really didn't matter. Even Thanos, if he showed up at the TVA, probably couldn't fathom the fact that Infinity Stones are just uh, paperweights on on like some bureaucrat's desk who works a nine to five job and does like is like a librarian. Like how amazing! Like I thought that was a great way to put perspective into Loki because again, this Loki does change more into an antihero by the time we get to Thor Ragnarok and Infinity War. He does try to do the right things in some of those stories, especially when he dies fighting Thanos um, to protect his brother. He, he makes the ultimate sacrifice. So there is good in this Loki. So I saw a lot of people going, 
this Loki's bad. How could he change in just like five or six episodes? I'm like, but he has the capacity to change. We've already seen him change in the main Marvel Universe. Now he gets the cliff notes of his life, how he led his, the bad guys to kill his mother in Thor the Dark World, how he loses uh, you know, his father Odin in Thor Ragnarok, um, and then how he dies saving his brother in Infinity War. Like He sees all those events and then sees that uh, you know, the, the Infinity Stones are paperweights. All of that changes him. Um, it does. And then meeting Sylvie also adds to that change, and it gets him to be a little less selfish. And so it was hard. Hard to watch him so struggle so much with the change, but then give in to it and be like, this isn't so bad, this change. Um, I don't want to be the guy who just screws up enough to where other people, it raises their status. Heroes become more heroic because of my actions. Um, I don't want to be that guy anymore. Even to the point where in the fifth episode and all the Lokis are fighting, boastful Loki and uh, classic old man Loki and kid Loki, alligator Loki, president Loki, like all of them are fighting and betraying each other. I'm like, I betrayed you. Well, I'm betraying you right now. Oh yeah, well, I'm betraying you. And he's just off to the side going, oh my God, like this is what we are. We can't stop ourselves. We're, we're predictable and boring and I don't want to be that anymore. So he sees an opportunity for change and he, like a narcissist that he is, he loves the sound of his own voice. He loves his, you know, the sight of his own tricks. You know, he loves everything about himself. Of course, he's going to fall in love with a variant of himself. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know. I thought all that was just very fitting for the character. But I also thought it was also fitting for the change that we saw in the character. Uh, that he was starting to be... You can't really call him less selfish because he was caring about Sylvie, who was another version of him. So it's kind of still selfish. But they are completely different people. They... Sh they make because i saw a lot of people they were like oh i'm weirded out by the kiss and stuff like that i'm like well yeah but she's just kissing him not romantically so much maybe there's a tinge of that in there but i always felt like throughout this whole show loki cared more for her than she cared for loki she doesn't trust anyone she might now now that she knows she screwed up um but she didn't then so when she kissed him she it was just a distraction so she could get that device and teleport loki to the tva again which he does go back to tva but he goes back to a variant version of the TVA where they don't know him and where Kang the Conqueror is the ruler. Uh, so I, I loved all that. I thought it was great. Um, I, like I said, my foot went in my mouth because I was going into the finale going, it doesn't make sense to bring in Immortus and Kang and all that because it's a character that means nothing to these characters. So why bring him in? Why don't you wrap up the story for these characters? But that's also me. I, as a writer, I like to button things up. I don't like long form storytelling, but Marvel clearly is all about long form storytelling. But I just figured since WandaVision has breadcrumbs of things that can be picked up on later and Falcon and Winter Soldier has breadcrumbs on things that can be picked up later, I just didn't expect Loki to literally open the world. And now that the multiverse is here because Jonathan Majors as Immortus or as He Who Remains has said right before he dies, this is only the beginning. If you think I'm bad, like I'm the one who actually condensed everything to one timeline and prevented you know, more war from the multiverse, but you kill me there's going to be another multiverse war. And then eventually they'll it'll whittle back down to just one version of me again. And I'll be right back here in this seat. So you kill me, I'll see you soon. And so Sylvie does and opens up the timeline, which now makes sense because we're getting what if next. In just less than a month, we're going to get a show that completely deals with the multiverse and all these splintered fractions that probably stem from the moment where Sylvie stabbed Immortus. So, uh, or he who remains. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. So yeah, I'm going to put a link down below to my theories video if you want to check that out and hear me talk more about Loki and, and see what I got, else I got wrong because my some of my theories were not very uh, well thought out. But again, I was going off of a different mindset and I wasn't giving the show an, uh, enough credit to be uh, the impetus for more stories. I thought this was going to be more of a bookend of a story for Loki and not so much an expansion um, and, and the beginning of a redemption arc for the character. Um, I'm very happy that they're doing that and I let the show convince me and change my mind through great acting and great scenery and, and stuff. And the, the fight between Loki and Sylvie, it's like, yeah, you got to put that in there for people who like action, but I really enjoyed that the most of this finale was dialogue. Um, I kind of like that. I wasn't expecting that. And it was so great to see Kang explaining everything. And now we got kind of our final member of the Young Avengers with Iron Lad. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited because he's telling us, like, yeah, there's different versions of me. We work together. There was harmony. You know, universes were sharing resources and food and we were helping each other out. But then a couple versions of me that thought the opposite of peace started popping up and they created the multiverse war. So uh, we essentially got someone here who could be the Thanos of phase four and maybe even phase five, depending on how long they want to run with this multiverse stuff. But, uh, 
so I'm excited for that. And I think they got a good actor to do it, and I liked his performance here, and I can't wait to see him next in Ant-Man and Wasp uh, Quantumania. That's going to be great. And I can't wait to watch uh, the, you know, the What If show with you guys. So actually, me and Alex are coming back. We're bringing back our reaction show. And every week, we're going to watch What If um, and do a live reaction like we did through StreamYard and stuff like we did with the DC animated movies. We're going to do that. And also, because, you know, we I talked about this before. I always go back and forth. I want to do more DC content, but it doesn't get a lot of views. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people out there that want to see my DC content, so I'll still make it from time to time. It'll be my spare show that I do, um, and Seek and Destroy will be kind of our main show. But I did want to replace Venom Vlog with something else uh, at, you know, after we finish Venom Vlog, but just a podcast, something where I'm just talking, where you don't really see me in every episode. You'll just see me in the occasional Seek and Destroy episodes. But, uh, but otherwise, I want to do a podcast, and it's going to focus on the Fantastic Four, uh, which I have the first 300 and something issues of Fantastic Four. And uh, and I love those characters. I love Doctor Doom. Uh, I love Kang. I love the Inhumans. I love Namor and Black Panther, uh, Silver Surfer, Galactus, and all those characters. Uh, most of them debuted in Fantastic Four comic books. So we're going to have a fun time going through the Stan Lee and Jack Kirby era of those characters. And we're going to do fun little like five to ten minute podcasts um, after the Venom vlog. So I'm going to start getting all that stuff ready now. That way we can follow the building of the Marvel Universe version of the Fantastic Four. And anytime there's references, like in, you know, in WandaVision, they mentioned S.W.O.R.D. They were like, oh, we haven't had any manned missions to space in a while. I'm like, well, I know where you're going with that because there's probably going to be a manned mission you're going to need four very specific scientists for, and they're going to probably pop up in a future movie. So I think that was kind of setting up them, the Fantastic Four, a little bit. Um, and then obviously we got Kang now, which kind of ties in the Fantastic Four because his name is Nathaniel Richards. So he's a descendant, uh, actually, of the characters from Fantastic Four comics. And we'll get more into that into that show. But I, I think I, I'm finally ready to do Fantastic Four. And I think because they're going to be the next big Marvel movie thing, I think that'll be a good thing to talk about leading up to that movie um, because I'm excited for that movie. Even though they got a director who I'm not super excited for because it's the guy who directed the, the Spider-Man movies and I'm not a big fan of the Marvel Spider-Man movies. So uh, I don't hate them. I just, I feel like they could have got a, a different director. Uh, but we'll see. I'm still willing to give the person a chance and I can't wait to see who they cast as the characters. So let me know what you think of Loki. Uh, this is awesome. I'm very excited for the future of Marvel stuff now because I'm a Kang the Conqueror fan and I'm a Young Avengers fan. I'm also a Thunderbolts fan and I, we got Zemo and we got um, the, the other Captain America, like the evil, the, not, he's not evil, I guess, but uh, he's like the US agent now. Um, we have him that could be a member of Thunderbolts. Uh, we have uh, Abominations coming back in Shang-Chi. He could be a member of the Thunderbolts. He could be their Hulk. So I was starting to think, uh, we have Yelena Belova, you know, that could be a member of the Thunderbolts. I was starting to think about what if in this phase, we don't see the building of the Avengers, but we see the building of the either Dark Avengers or Thunderbolts. And I'm in for that. So if we get Thunderbolts being built over here, Young Avengers over here, especially since the Young Avengers are very essential in taking Kang down in at least one major story in the comic books. Uh, I'm curious to see how that's all going to interweave together. So if you have anything you want to discuss about the Disney Plus shows or you want to mention about Loki or Young Avengers or comics or anything I talked about here and you want to let it be known down below, please do. Please comment. Again, whether you you know have an encyclopedic knowledge or whether you're new to comics or new to this world, doesn't matter. We, all, we welcome everybody here. Let me know what your thoughts are down below. I would love to talk to you about any of this stuff. I'm very pumped for it. I was even bugging my coworkers at work today about all this. I was like, oh my God, there's Kang and there's like, you know, we got Stature and Kate Bishop's coming up and now we got uh, possibly Iron Lad reference here. Uh, we got so much. All these young Avengers are popping up. Like it was so funny. I was getting into it and they were just like, all right, dude, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I just made me realize how much I, I do love this stuff and how, um, how healing to me, to my, my mind and, and, you know, in its deteriorating state, how healing this stuff is to me. And that's why I don't want to just completely disappear from YouTube after the Venom vlog. That's why I want to still talk about comics, especially comics I'm passionate about. And we've had fun with Venom, and we've mentioned a lot of Fantastic Four and Reed Richards stuff during our run of co covering Venom stuff. So I think it's an easy transition to go into Fantastic Four comics. And it's going to be a blast. I really love those characters. So that'll be something we start uh, January of next year. Um, but I'll still try to cover a few things leading up to that. 
from time to time. Um, but uh, but otherwise, we're going to just focus on Venom now until the end of the year. And that'll be the show that replaces Venom. So I hope you guys are excited for that. And make sure you tune in, stay subscribed, because we're going to do live reactions to every episode of What If, me and my friend Alex, in our new show called Uwatube, The Watchers. Uh, yes, and I'm going to spell it right there so you can see that I'm adding in Uwatu, The Watcher, and how I'm spelling it into combining it with YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's our new show, and that's going to be starting very soon. So thank you so much. I appreciate you guys watching and liking and subscribing and all that fun stuff. And we'll see you all in the future. Peace.